The Five Factor Model of Personality, Part 2 of 3, The Five Traits. Professor Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. Hi, in this unit we're going to be talking about what each of the five traits are. We're going to look at comparisons between those five traits and existing trait models we've already talked about in class. For example, neuroticism and extroversion show up in the five-factor model and also are key components of Ising's model of personality that we've discussed previously in class. Also, within Jerry Wiggins, two-component model of personality, his circumplex model. The two trait, main traits are dominance versus submissiveness and agreeableness versus quarrelsomeness. And you'll find the agreeableness dimension from Wigan circumplex as part of the five-factor model. For each trait, we'll talk about the trait in general something about the highs and the lows and how individuals on each end behave. But remember, each trait in the five-factor model is normally distributed in the population and most people are somewhat in the middle. For each trait, we'll talk about the highs, the lows. I will show you what are called facets, which are subscales for each of the five traits. And then I will show you some of the behaviors for individuals who perform on the extreme ends of each of the five factors. This comes from an article written by Robert McRae that appears in a book by Costa and Whittaker on psychopathologies related to the five factor model of personality. So let's start looking at these traits. The first trait is neuroticism. Neuroticism is associated with emotional stability and personal adjustment, relatively the same dimension as Ising's. People who are high on neuroticism are vulnerable to anxiety, depression, other types of stress disorders far more than other individuals are. Individuals extremely low on neuroticism tend to be calm and well-adjusted. Well, we'll see how well-adjusted the extremes are on neuroticism in a second. The six facets of neuroticism are anxiety, anger, depression, self-consciousness, impulsivity, and vulnerability. Quite a nice mix of things that stress people out. Here are some of the highs and lows for each of the five traits. For extreme high neurotic individuals, they have chronic negative affect, anxiety, fearfulness, tension. They have difficulty inhibiting impulses, and they're perfectionistic. Individual extremely low on the neuroticism factor, have problems with social adjustment and health. They tend not to take care of themselves physically. They also suffer from what I've called Ben Stein disease or emotional blandness. They don't display a lot of affect. They never get really excited uh, positively or negatively about anything. The second trait is extroversion. And extreme extroverts are on one end of the trait and extreme introverts on the other. This is similar but slightly different than Ising's model trait of extroversion. In Isinkian extroversion, it's related to biological processes, primarily in the ascending reticular activating system. Big five extroversion is a blend of social dominance 
and extroversion on one end, and submissiveness and introversion on the opposite end. Generally, we've already talked a lot about extroverts. Very social, outgoing people like to engage in the world, like to engage with other people. Introverts, on the other hand, are reserved and more independent. They tend to keep to themselves. Facets of extroversion include gregariousness, warmth, assertiveness, active, excitement-seeking, and positive emotionality. High scores for extroversion, well, they never stop talking, and they also have inappropriate social disclosure. These are the kind of people that tell you their entire life history within five people, within five minutes, and probably people, of getting to know them. They're uh, drama kings and queens with a dramatic expression of emotions. They like excitement seeking, and they like to dominate and control other people, even when it's inappropriate. Low scores on extroversion are individuals who face social isolation, emotional detachments. They have poor social networks, not a lot of emotions, kind of flattened affect. They don't have a lot of joy and interest in life, and they suffer from social inhibition and shyness. Openness is a very interesting personality trait. It's one of those dimensions that makes the five-factor model unique. In the early 1960s, the trait of openness was originally construed as culture. And it had items on openness scales such as, I like to go to the opera, I like to go to the symphony. Uh, or they would be questions that would be heavily laden with social economic status. And so it picked up a big chunk of social economic status, not what the modern scales pick up, which is an interest in anything, intellectual curiosity. They have divergent thinking. Their thought patterns are all over the place. And high open people are very imaginative. People on the high end of openness tend to be unconventional, independent thinkers. One of my favorite little pieces of research was done by John Kilstrom. He found that individuals who are high on the openness dimension are far more easily hypnotizable than individuals who are not open. Why, we don't know, but I find it a fascinating finding. Individuals low on the openness dimension tend to prefer the familiar day-to-day -day things. They're not very imaginative. They like to go to the same places, engage in the same things, uh, and not stretch out their interest. The facets of openness are being prone to fantasy open to feelings, open to diverse behaviors, or a lot of open stuff, right? Open to ideas and various beliefs and things like that. Now, highly open people can have preoccupations with fantasies and daydreaming. They're not practical thinkers, they're eccentrics. On the downside, they're susceptible to nightmares and altered states of consciousness and maybe socially rebellious and non-conforming, which may interfere with social or vocational advancement. They follow their own drummer. Individuals low on openness have difficulties adapting to social or personal change. They do not understand other individuals' points of view. They have a low tolerance for that. They also aren't accepting of other individuals' lifestyles. They suffer from emotional blandness and can't verbalize their feelings. They have a very small range of interest, 
They don't like art and beauty, but they're really good at conforming to authority. The next dimension is agreeableness. Individuals with high scores on agreeableness are helpful, trusting, sympathetic. They want to agree with people. They like to get along. As I previously said, this is similar to one of the traits of Wigan's circumplex model. Individuals with low scores on agreeableness tend to be very quarrelsome. They're ant uh, antagonistic, excuse me, and skeptical about the world. Here are the facets for agreeableness. Straightforward, altruistic, compliant, trusting, modest, but tender-minded. Now, can you be too agreeable and friendly? Yeah. One of the principal problems with individuals that high, score highly on agreeableness is that they're gullible. They trust other people indiscriminately, which can get them into serious trouble with individuals who are taking advantage of them. They're very candid and they're generous to a point that it hurts them. They don't stand up to others when they disagree with them. And as you can see from the behaviors above, overall they're easily taken advantage of. I would imagine that highly agreeable people are very likely to be victimized by con artists. Individuals who score extremely low on agreeableness are cynical and paranoid. They like to pick fights. They're quarrelsome. They like to argue about just about anything. They don't respect social conventions. They're liars, and they have an inflated sense of self-esteem. The last of the five traits is conscientiousness. Individuals high on conscientiousness are organized, plan-oriented, and determined. And this is conscientiousness versus unconscientiousness. Individuals on the low end of conscientiousness are careless, easily distracted from task, and just basically undependable. Conscientiousness has also been referred to by some as will to achieve or work. I happen to like that alternate definition of will to achieve, which comes from Digman's work, who we talked about in a previous video. The facets of conscientiousness are competence, orderliness, dutifulness, achievement-oriented, self-discipline, and deliberate. One of my favorite studies of conscientiousness was done by Robert Hogan at the University of Tulsa. Bob studied long-haul truck drivers, not generally participants you would think for a study having to do with personality traits. But he found that long-haul truckers tended to uh, have some issues, and he was brought in as a consultant. Those truckers who were extremely conscientious tended to be more on time with their loads, which is really critical for the trucking industry. Imagine, especially in our Central Valley, having fruits and vegetables showing up a few days late on the truck. Probably not very good. They received fewer tickets for driving infractions. Uh, when you and I get a ticket, it's... Uh, a very annoying thing when a professional truck driver gets a ticket it's substantially much more money usually the fine is paid by the company so firms you can imagine are looking for truck drivers that aren't going to get tickets so those I think are some interesting components of individuals high in conscientiousness here are our extremes Extremely highly conscientious people, and we all like to think that we're highly conscientious, but can you be too conscientious? What happens when you hit that? 
overachievement, workaholic, compulsivism, excessive cleanliness, attention to detail, inability to set task aside, no spontaneousness, uh, very moral. Uh, being conscientious is a good thing, but if you put all of these things together, you get someone who can be extremely perfectionistic. And one of the chief problems with perfectionists is they never finish anything. I'll come back to this lecture later. Hang on a bit. Just kidding. Let's look at the low conscientiousness, folks. Underachieving. They don't reach their potential. They don't uh, perform well academically. They're not into rules, no self-discipline, and they can be kind of aimless and wandering through life, all of which aren't very, very good things. So those are the five traits. Here is a chart that shows you different researchers from the classic era of big five trait research and factor analysis starting in the late 1940s, ending in the late 1980s. Uh, you can see different researchers and their different trait labels for the big five. This is kind of a Rosetta Stone for different big five researchers. You see the classic labels by Norman in 1963, Surgency, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotionality, and culture. The more modern view, that's the accepted labels for the traits now. Extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, neuroticism, and openness. If you look up at the top on the second line down, you see ISYNC's model subsuming into the five factors. You see, there is not a trait that represents openness. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, extroversion and neuroticism are two of Isink's primary traits. And research into comparisons of the two models show that Isink's dimension of psychoticism is a blend of low agreeableness and low conscientiousness, which is highly psychotic on the one end, with the low ends representing stability. Not a perfect fit, but it's the best fit that that third dimension makes into the five factors. So, several questions come out of this. Are five factors enough to describe human personality? There are many people out there gunning to find the sixth factor. And since some things weren't originally put into the five-factor model, in terms of analysis, you're not going to get anything out. So sex, gender-related terms were dropped early on. That's not represented. And although openness to experience is correlated with intelligence, one of my favorite ideas is that intelligence is a major model trait of personality as I believe that intelligent people behave differently than people who are not intelligent. We could spend the rest of the semester talking about different trait models with more traits than these, but it seems like five is kind of a good sweet spot for a robust model of personality. And if you remember the subtitle to this lecture, Warren Norman never believed it was a total personality model, but he thought rather it was a step towards an adequate trait model or taxonomy of personality. This has been a we have couches, video production, all rights reserved. Bye now.